All right, cool. Um, before we get going, I just I would be remiss to tell you, and uh, John, our uh, executive director, he'd probably beat me over the head with a baseball bit if I didn't tell you about a brand new website we've been working on, Cable8.net. For our members, you can pay your membership. You can find our programming on here. You can find uh, clips of this wonderful interview. Um, you can find us also on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram, all those good things. So check us out. Uh, um, all our social media platforms, but make sure you go to cable8.net. So anyway, now that that's out of the way, with me is uh, Alan Askenazi from Queens, New York, and he uh, played for the Boston Red Sox farm team right here in Greensboro, North Carolina, right there at the um, War Memorial yes. Stadium, for those of you that uh, maybe remember. Um, but now he runs the Greensboro Batting Center, and uh, I'm so glad to have you here. It's great uh, to be you here. Have a, you have a great story. Thank and, you. Uh, um, so tell me about uh, where you grew up. You grew up in New York. Okay, so I, I, I was born in Brooklyn. My dad's a longtime Brooklyn guy. I was born in Brooklyn, but we moved to Queens, I think right in, in 1964. I was born in 1960, so we lived in Brooklyn for a few years, and we moved to Queens to a garden apartment complex called Glen Oaks that was the greatest place to grow up. Still very close with all my friends from Glen Oaks. There's websites about Glen Oaks that people write about what a great place to grow up. So it was a, a town uh, in, called Glen Oaks. It was off Union Turnpike and 260th Street, about 15 minutes from the Nassau borderline, about 30 minutes from Manhattan depending on whether you went by bus or train or car. So uh, we moved there in 1964, and I lived there until I uh, moved, down, new, moved to Greensboro for good in February of 1987. Tell me about uh, growing up there. What was, the, what was the neighborhood like where you grew up? Um, walk outside and there's a bunch of kids ready to play anything. We lived across the street, so, you know, mostly a cement area. There was grass there, but everywhere you went, you walked, it was cement. But right in the middle of Glen Oaks was called The Oval. That was the name of it. And it was two baseball fields inside a chain link fence that the Glen Oaks Little League ran their league. But you can go there when there was no games going on and, and play, and we would figure out three-on-three -three games and four-on-four -four games. And there was also basketball courts there. If you see anything on TV about the New York City basketball courts, that was one of them where you just, you know, I lived in a court where I can walk to the end of my court, look to the right, and there was the oval. And I'd see if there were people playing basketball, which there always was, people playing baseball, there always was. We can walk. It was unbelievable place to hang out. We were at the oval all the time. Um, we had a, my school, PS 186, that I went from kindergarten to sixth grade. Um, they had a schoolyard there. It's kind of where I played the most pickup baseball on a cement park where the field was just painted lines and painted bases. And we slid on there. It was just terrific. Everywhere you went, there was sports. All my friends, we went to school together, we went to junior high together, we went to high school together, all the same people. And like I said, we're all good friends now. We still, as a matter of fact, next weekend, my five best friends growing up and their wives and me and my wife are meeting in Florida just to hang out. And we do that all the time. And these are my, the greatest friends of my life that I met in Glen Oaks. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, and tell me about, I mean, I guess somewhere along the line, what got you into really into baseball? You said you started playing games. Well, where yeah. did you really fine tune that? Oh, boy. So I was, I was, my dad was a great athlete. He was a big time basketball player. I was always too short to play basketball, but that was always my favorite I sport. Feel you. <laughs> yeah, I was always, but I, it was my favorite sport. And people also tell me that it was my best sport, that I was a better basketball player than I was baseball player. But I played all sports, so it's not like I picked baseball and that was it. I loved baseball in the spring and, and the summer. I loved basketball. We played, I never played tackle football. We played flag football, so that was fun. 
um, played in basketball leagues. We even played in running hockey leagues. So, and I was good at everything. I was not a superstar because I wasn't as big as strong, but I was good at everything and I was fast. Um, when I got mostly into baseball is when I knew I wasn't big enough to play basketball. I wasn't big enough to play football. I didn't know how to skate on ice to play hockey. So I just started focusing on baseball, but I never stopped the other sports growing up. I don't think I stopped the other sports until I actually got into pro baseball. So I think I got serious in baseball when I was probably a junior or senior in high school when I knew I had a chance to play college baseball. And that's when I never thought of that until I got to that point. I started getting good enough where people were looking at me, but not as many as I wanted because again, I was short and it's probably worse now, but um, I, I, I knew I could play college baseball. I knew I'd be good at it. It was just a matter of if somebody would give me a chance. Um, my high school team was really good, never won championships or anything, but we were really good. We had some guys who were really good. Our catcher was drafted by the Mets. He went to a college. Uh, he went to the. He actually went to the college I ended up going to, but he got, he went there first. He was a year ahead of me, um, and I I just got. I think I started really getting serious with getting in shape for baseball, lifting weights for baseball, hitting in the winter. Probably my junior or senior year of high school is when I really knew that maybe I had a chance. Yeah. And uh, were you thinking about college at that time? Yeah, I never had pro ball on my mind until I got to college. I never thought I was good enough to, yeah. to, to play pro ball. My brother, my oldest brother, Mike, he was a terrific baseball player. And I thought he had a chance to play professionally. But because we went through it for the first time, he made some mistakes. Didn't get in front of the right people, this and that. So I think his mistakes helped me because what he did wrong, he kind of tutored me to do it right. So I think I was not as good a baseball player as him. I went further than him because of his experience. Yeah, it's amazing how that, that yes. works. The, the older sibling, you, you get to kind of, as a younger sibling, you get to kind of watch back, sit back right. and watch what they did. Right, that's right. <laughs> and, and he was a patient. terrific player. Yeah. He was a terrific player. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's not easy at that. Once you start getting into, I mean, even younger, especially nowadays, there's all kinds of leagues and stuff. Right. Which you're, you're a part of all this. So right. That's, that's, that's right. your world. Yes. But it's super competitive young now. Yes. And people train younger and, you know, they, they want to get the, the upper hand on people. And I'll never forget when I was in high school, I went to a baseball clinic at Adelphi University. This was probably 1978. I went to a baseball clinic at Adelphi University being run by Ron Polk, who was the head baseball coach of Mississippi State. He's a, probably a Hall of Fame coach, uh, you know, probably not coaching now, I'm sure he's not. But he was doing a clinic and we, he, we were there and everybody was in the bleachers of the gym. It was more of a talking clinic. So me and a few of my teammates and one of my assistant coaches from my high school, we went to watch him. And I'll never forget, this is when video games first started coming out. Atari was the first video game where you played Pong. Yeah, right? the ball that, was, that goes Right, back the ball went back and forth on a stick, right? You went back and forth. So Atari was just <clears throat> getting famous. And I'll never forget, the place was packed with kids and coaches and parents. And he just paced back and forth in front of the bleachers about 10 times. And he, in a loud voice, he just goes, Remember, when you're home playing Atari, somebody's out there getting better than you. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. Wow. Yeah, very strong. And uh, was, did you have that on your mind? Like you talked about lifting, you talked about uh, you know, getting better in, in high school. Did you have that on your mind? Like, hey, I can really, if I hone in on skills, maybe I can, yeah, maybe I, I could detail I, this out. Yeah, but I never looked at pro baseball. Mm -hmm. I, I just never thought I was big enough or good enough to play pro baseball. And the funny thing about me is where some kids peaked when they were younger, I didn't really peak until I got into college. Like, I kept getting better and better. So I was just, to me, I was just a middle, maybe 
if we had 15 guys on my high school team, maybe I was the seventh best or the eighth mm -hmm. best, something like that. And then I went to, so I, I, the first college I went to, I wanted to play baseball in Florida. So the first college I went to in the fall of 1978, so I graduated high school in June of 1978, I went to Miami-Dade South Community College in Florida. I always wanted to play baseball in Florida. So, I, you know, no scholarships, it was a junior college. So I went there, um, the, the guy, so it's only a two-year school, and the guy who, another second baseman came in. Now, I was offered a scholarship to New York Tech where I ended up going. I wanted to go to Adelphi University because that's where my older brother went. But the, the coach of that team, Ron Davies, was, he recruited big, strong hitters. And I was a little singles, doubles, stolen base guy. So I wasn't really his repertoire. You know, it's not who he wanted. So he never offered me a scholarship, even though my brother was a star there five years earlier. So New York Tech offered me a scholarship, and the catcher who I was talking about before, Bobby Costello, he already got a scholarship to New York Tech. So I was going to follow him uh, because we played high school together, and then we were going to go to play college together. So, but I wanted to go, so I went to Miami-Dade South, and the guy who was starting over me was also a freshman. So there were two of us playing second base. He was starting and he was a freshman. And I just thought, if I sit for these two years, I'm never gonna, that'll be the end of my baseball career. So I called the coach back at New York Tech and asked him if I can come back. And back then, if you transferred, you had to sit out a year. So, wow. seven, so I went to Miami-Dade South in fall of 78. I came to New York Tech in the winter of 1979, I guess, Classes start in January. I had to sit out that whole season, but I had to go to class, but I had to sit out that whole season, but I got to practice with them. And even though the fall, you sat out in the fall, I had to sit out in the fall too, but the fall really wasn't a season, but they had fall baseball at all the colleges. So even though I wasn't on the team yet, I got to play in the fall and I did really well. But I, when, when, 1980 came now because, right, 78, 79, I had to sit out. So, the, so 1980, my freshman year now at New York Tech, they had a second baseman who was a senior and he was a, the captain. Brian Fitzpatrick was his name. And he was a great guy, a great leader, but he wasn't, I was better than he was. But he was there, you know. He got hurt and I got a chance. And he never got back on the field the whole season. I had a terrific freshman year. Um, and that's when I knew, you know what? I'm a lot better. Balls were jumping off my bat when I was making contact like I'd never saw before. So something clicked. Whether I got stronger, I didn't get bigger. I mean, this is all I got. You know, but something clicked, and, um, and I knew I was good. And I, 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 uh, I made all whatever, all northeast region or something like that as a freshman it was a division two school at that time and then my sophomore year moved to division one wow. now it, you said that now this was the moment when you realized you yes. thought this could be something yeah before that what did you have anything else on your mind of what you, you no. might have wanted to do nothing or you, we just kind of live in life no, i was living life i was i had no idea what i wanted to do i i knew i wanted to do something in baseball but Shoot, I was, you know, I was always young. Like, I graduated high school. I was still 17. You know, I, st I didn't turn 18 until my December of my freshman year in college. So I, I really had no idea. I was kind of letting these next four years play out to m help me figure out what I wanted to do, you know. But I really had, it's not like I grew up and I wanted to be a doctor or I want to be, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I did know I didn't want to sit behind a desk from nine to five and do the same thing over and over and over and over. Yeah. I, I knew that. Like, yeah. I knew that. Yeah. 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 That's, I, that could be like a prison. Right. <laughs> I, I, it didn't matter what kind of money it could make. I just, I, that's something I wasn't going to do. Um, okay. So at uh, college, you, st you started to see the, see the bug that you were, the, the itch that, that you got. Yeah. Um, where did you go from there to the uh, to the Boston farm team? So um, 
my sophomore year is where in college I really clicked. I led the nation in stolen bases. I broke some records in New York Tech. I was leadoff guy. And it's funny, that year, the catcher, Bobby Costello, got drafted by the Mets the next year. No, that year, because he was a year ahead of me, so he was a junior. He was getting in the newspapers about breaking the New York Tech hit, hit record. The whole season, th that's all you heard. Bobby Costello's getting closer to the New York Tech hit record. He's getting closer, he's getting closer. And I, would, and I had a lot of hits too. I was behind him the whole time. So he finally broke the hit record with like six or seven games left in the season. And by the end of the season, I broke his record. So it, it I, and I led the nation in stolen bases. I had a terrific year. I, um, you know, people from New York Tech didn't make all American. You know, we made all ECAC, all Northeast, whatever. So that year, everything clicked for me. I was a, a the, one of the, even at 18 or I, I was turning 20, I think, right? 19. That would have been 1981. So I was 20, turning 21. Um, I was the leader of that team, even as. I, really, I was just a sophomore, but I had such a good year, and my father started seeing that I was going to be good. My brothers knew I was going to be good. People just, you know, people in the summer leagues wanted me to play over, so I knew I was going to be good. I didn't know how far I could take, but I had a terrific year. I was on people's radars now. And then my junior year, I went in with so much, I put so much pressure on myself to equal what I did my sophomore year. And it was really my only down year of my career. I still hit 300, but, you know, because I was, I led the nation in stolen bases. I was on everybody's radar. So where I stole 60 bases my sophomore year, my junior year, I only had 19. Only hit 300 where my sophomore year hit 411. So I, I was a, I had a, you know, a, I had a, a bullseye on my back. People were, wanted to get me. Um, but the funny thing about that year is the guy who hit behind me, Mike Salvamini, from Uniondale, Long Island, still a good friend of mine, he won the triple crown on the team. He led the team in home runs, RBIs, and batting average. He hit behind me. And one thing my coach, Bob Hirschfield, said, he said, you know, Al, there's something that's just as good as being a base stealer. It's being a threat to be a base stealer. So I didn't understand. But I did realize as the season went on, when I got on base, all Mike Salvamini saw were fastballs because every catcher wanted to throw me out stealing. The, the, ment the mental game yes, gets into he, the... All they wanted to do was throw me out stealing. And they knew that if they threw a curveball to the hitter up, that they weren't going to throw me out it stealing. Was, it's too slow to get to the That's plate right. for the, that, the catcher. Exactly. To, so you've already got, what, you know, 10 steps on that. Right. That's um, right. So my base stealing went down, but his batting average went up. His home run total went up. Uh, his RBI total went up. So I figured that out. And when I got to my senior year, I thought it was my last year of playing baseball. So I still worked hard over the off season. But I went to this, into the season thinking it's going to be the last year I'm ever going to play baseball. I went in and had just said, I'm just going to have fun. I'm just going to have a ball. I'm not going to put any pressure on myself. I'm just going to have a ball. And I had the best season of my career, my senior year. And when the season ended, we ended up, we played in the, the ECAC tournament to go to the College World Series. Back then, the College World Series was legit a team from the North... The Northeast region was a real Northeast team. It's not like they sent Carolina out to the West region. There were eight teams in the World Series, a Northeast team, a Southeast team, a Midwest team, a, a West team, and they played. So the University of Maine was the best team in the Northeast. They would go to the World Series a lot in the 80s, and there was no limit on games. So we were playing in that tournament to go to the World Series, which they eventually won. And they went to the World Series, and if you look at the stats of the World Series that year, you would see that because there were no limits of games, and now there are, I think the University of Maine, maybe they were 30 and 6, and they would play the University of Miami 96 and 12, because <laughs> Maine can't play starting in January, but Miami can. So 
the press conference after we lost. We lost to um, LaSalle, who John Marzano was the, he was a top draft pick. He was a catcher, was drafted by the Red Sox. I got to know him when I was in the Red Sox organization. So it's a small world. You know, you're playing against a guy, you hear all about him, and you think he's the greatest player of all time, and then you get to meet him and see, you know what? He's not only a great player, he's a great guy, you know? So they did, a, after we lost, we had a, there was a press conference, because it was a big tournament. We had a, a big press conference, and me and a couple other guys on my team and my coach was sitting at the press conference. One of the things they asked me said, so what's your plans now? And I guess they meant baseball-wise. And I said, I'm not really sure. I guess I can get on some kind of softball team in the next couple of weeks and start playing softball. And they, they all started laughing. And then the Red Sox came calling, and I ended up in the Red Sox organization. Wow. Yeah. What, what was that like when you, when you found out you were going to be a part of that? Un unbelievable, right? It was unbelievable. I, when when the, the, the season ended, there were tryouts all over the place. You know, the Mets had a tryout at Shea Stadium. The Yankees had tryouts at Yankee Stadium. So I went to all the tryouts, but everybody knew me. It, it, I didn't have to go to these tryouts, but I figured, look, this is the last hurrah. Who's going get, to get a chance to play at Shea Stadium or Yankee Stadium? And it's funny, I played in college all-star games in that after the season ended, before I went to the Red Sox organization, and they were at Yankee Stadium. So I got to play at Yankee Stadium, got to play at Shea Stadium That's in cool. all-star games. Um, but when I found out I was going to sign, um, Matt Sesney, who was the scout from Northeast for the Red Sox. He, he came to my house to sign my contract and he asked me, how much money do you want? And I said, what are you talking about? I didn't know anything about bonuses or anything. He says, well, we got a little money as a bonus. I said, Mr. Sesney, I'll play for nothing. That's what I told him. He says, well, look, we got a thousand dollars for you. I was, you know, I was a low guy. I wasn't a high draft pick or anything. And, um, he said, we got $1,000. I said, okay, I'll take that. He goes, okay, I'll give you 500 now and 500 when you get to spring training. And I thought it was all the money in the world. You know, I grew up, we didn't have a lot of money. We, I signed the contract in my kitchen with my mom and dad and my brothers and sister. And it, unbelievable, unbelievable. Just think how it would feel to sign a baseball contract. And a couple of days later in the mail, I got my contract signed and when you sign, I don't know if still if you did this, but you also signed a contract, contract with Topps Baseball for $1. So they have your right if you make it. Wow. So it's an unbelievable experience. Yeah. yeah. And tell me about, uh, you know, you uh, obviously went to spring training and all that stuff. How was, what was that like for you? So when I got to spring, my first spring training, who knew what to expect, right? I went to my first spring training and the Red Sox had just drafted, then top draft pick was Jeff Ledbetter. He was the big time home run hitter for Florida State. And all the press were there because we were in Winter Haven, Florida. So he was their first pick. All the press was there. And their second pick got a little press too, was Roger Clemens. So that was the same year. And uh, I didn't know what to expect. I was living with People I didn't know. Actually, I lived with Ellis Burks, who played in the Red Sox big leagues and became a star with the Colorado Rockies. And he was my first roommate from Fort Worth, Texas. He got drafted out of a junior college in Texas. And he was my first roommate. He's really one of the greatest players I ever saw. And that if he didn't get hurt most of his career, he would have been probably a Hall of Famer. So I was just trying to learn on the fly. I remember, I was a lot. I was older than some of these guys because I had graduated college. A lot of these people were drafted out of high school or junior college. I had already graduated college. I was already, you know, 22, turning 23. So I was already old. So I knew it wasn't going to be long. But I hustled everywhere and got praise from the managers and the coaches out there. And they ended up putting me in high A for my first year. In, so I got to play in the Florida State League, which was in Winter Haven, Florida. And it turned out to be not great because I sat behind a bonus baby from San Diego State, Chris Canazaro Jr., 
So I played a 144 game season. I only got up about 60 times. So I sat this, the bench the whole year. Oh, man. Yeah, so it was a tough year. And then they, my next year they sent me to Greensboro and I made an all-star. I, I was leading off. As a matter of fact, I batted ninth for the first nine games of the season. Manny Jose was the leadoff guy and I was batting ninth. We lost the first nine games of the season. They flip-flopped the two of us. He went to nine, I went to one. We ended up playing in the championship that year and Manny Jose won the batting title out of the nine hole. <laughs> <laughs> so it turned out to be a great move. Wow. Yeah, and I, w I was always, I was in the top five in stolen bases that year. I made an all-star team. I only hit about 260, but I had over 100 hits. I had over 100 walks. I was in the top five in stolen bases. I, I led maybe one or two in runs scored for the season. So I had a really good year. But I knew my career was over when the next year they sent me back to Greensboro yeah. instead of moving me up. Yeah. So I knew that was it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, was, what was your impression of Greensboro when you got here? I was a New York City guy. Um, I heard accents I never heard of in my life. Um, I never really traveled, you know, I, being from New York. I played in New Jersey. I played in Maine. I, you know, I played on the East Coast. Um, I've never been, except for Florida, I've never been past the Mason-Dixie line. So it was different. It was different. And I was a New York City guy with a heavy accent at the time, and you know, but I was a fan favorite, so they made it. You know, I was that blue collar guy that everybody liked, and you know, and it's really where I came out of my shell. Like we're doing this interview now, when I would have never talked in front of a camera. Back then, I, I, they were looking for interviews, and I was always the guy they came to, and I learned how to talk. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And that probably helped you now. With yes. Your, your yeah. Charisma yes. ability to yeah. talk to people and work with parents and kids and that sort of thing. The first interview I did was for whatever Fox 8 turned into. I used to be before Fox 8. They did an interview on me, and one of the questions was, how did you feel when, the, I'm a big Nick fan, how did you feel when the Knicks just drafted Patrick Ewing? So that, what was that, 1984, I think. Mm -hmm. So that was my first interview, 1984. Isn't that crazy? How did, how did you feel when you were doing that, that first, that first uh, pre-Fox 8 <laughs> interview? Comfortable. Yeah. Right? Talk, let people know who I was, answer honestly, you know. I, I loved it. I, I knew that was a thing that I could do, Yeah. you know. That's awesome. And I was always shy, you know. I didn't have a lot of girlfriends growing up. I was always shy. And um, uh, so I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. Um, and then you, you, you stayed on for a second year. Right. And, Injury uh, prone that year. Yeah. And then I, I, got, I got released in the Mets played the Red Sox in the World Series in 86. Mm -hmm. And I got my release notice in the mail in November of 86. Um, and I was okay. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I knew that playing baseball was going to delay my life a little bit, where I could make decision. I knew I wanted to do something like an indoor batting cage. I was going to do it in New York, but there were a bunch of them there. I had a girlfriend in Greensboro, and um, I ended up staying and opening up the Greensboro Batting Center. I got released in November of 86, and me and my partner, Steve Schwartz, who's not, no longer my partner, but still one of my closest friends that I grew up with, his parents and my parents were best friends. We opened up in February of 1987. Wow. Yeah. And you've been, what was your first location? Was that on um, My first street? location was South Elm Eugene Street in the back of a business park. Wow. I think 7,000 square feet. We had four cages. Yeah. That was my first one. How did you open it? Did you have to take out a loan? How did, I took out, how, how I took out a $10,000 loan that I had no credit. Uh, uh, Mr. A lawyer in town, uh, Clendenin was his name. He was a big fan of the Greensboro Hornets and was a big fan of mine. Harry Clendenin, who has passed away a couple of years ago, 
um, he co-signed the loan. And part of the loan was after a year, as long as I made all the payments, we could take his name off, and I did. And that's how I, $10,000 loan. Harry Clendenin, forever wow. grateful. And that's a tough thing, opening up a business. Were, were you scared? Yeah, were you, I mean, were you worried? I, I didn't worry. I, I wasn't worried. Number one, I didn't have my money into it, and it was only $10,000. So I knew it was something I would try. And let's see if I can get to, through a year. When I got through a year, I said, right, let's see if we can get through two years. Then it was, <laughs> let's see if we can get through five. Then I, someone had told me that once you get to seven, you can start taking money for yourself. So we got to seven years, and I started to take money for myself. It was the first time. In the first years, I had no money, and I got a newspaper route for the news and record to pay my rent. Wow. And that's how I paid my rent. And then once we got to seven years is when I started taking salary. Steve Schwartz was out of it by then. So we got to seven, then we got to 10, then 15, then 20. Then 30, 35, and then February will be 37. Now, at, I can't remember the, the date. Was it, a, was it a morning route or was it an afternoon route for the, for the Mo paper? Morning, because I had to be at the batting center in the okay. afternoon. I yeah, it was a morning route. W did the paper merge by then? They were the Greensboro News and News Record. And Record. Okay, yes. they had merged by then. Yeah. I couldn't remember. They were the Greensboro News and Record. Yeah. Yes. And me and Steve Schwartz delivered. He folded them. I delivered them every morning to pay the rent. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and tell me about, so what was your, uh, I mean, it was just, it's, obviously it's not what you've expanded a whole lot, you know, from, from what it was, but did you have, um, you know, the camps and stuff like you do now? Yeah, um, no, we did more camps back then. We used to go out to fields and do camps. We had, we had camps out at Pleasant Garden. We had camps out in Brown Summit. We did camps at West, at uh, uh, the middle school, uh, the, the middle school that feeds to Western Guilford, we did camps there. But as time went on, I didn't, I, I didn't like camps. I like to do the one-on-one -on -one thing. So mm -hmm. if my instructors want, want to do camps, then we keep it going. But it wasn't my, I didn't really like camps. You know, me personally, I didn't like running camps. I would rather go one-on-one -on -one with a kid and teach him how to hit or field or whatever. So we did a lot of camps there. Um, a lot of the kids that now we do lessons with their kids started at our camps. Kids that, are, that went to our camps now coach some of our travel teams. Dusty Shutt, Byron Talton, uh, Dusty played at Grimsley, Byron played at Dudley. Their kids now play on one of our teams and they coach. So I'm probably missing, skipping some guys, but I am doing lessons now with the kids of parents that did lessons with me when they were kids. Some of them never even went on to baseball, but it was such a good experience for them that they wanted their kid to go, to go through it. So um, camps weren't, were big in the beginning, but not, not, my, not something I really enjoyed personally. But when I was out there, it was fun. It was just you know going out there and getting the lunch for the kids. It wasn't things I, I should have hired somebody to do that, but we didn't have the money to hire anybody right, to do that stuff. Right, right, right. How many, was it, was it just you and your partner doing it at the time? Yeah, so he was already, by the time we got to a um, couple of years into, so we started off at uh, South Elm Eugene Street, and then we moved to um, Golden Gate Shopping Center in 1990. And I think Steve Schwartz was out of it by 91. And so it was just me. And then I started having to hire instructors. And, um, but I was still doing a bulk of it and probably burnt myself out doing so many lessons. You know, I kind of created a monster because when I first opened up, if you wanted Al, you knew where he was going to be. And then when I finally started giving the reins to managers and other instructors, People didn't want to talk to them. They still wanted to talk to me. So I had to kind of train the public, you know, on, hey, you don't need me for everything. You know, asking about hours, one of my workers can do that. You know, when, what's our prices? One of my workers can tell you the prices. So that, that you know, where I had to be, um, where I had to be accessible to everybody to make my business go, 
as it started going, I was still, I, everybody still wanted to, to talk to me and, and putting in 70, 80 hours a week, you know, so it was tough. And yeah. It, yeah, you had to kind of decentralize yourself. Yeah, and, that, um, tried, yes. Yeah, hey, I hired these right. guys, trust, That's right. trust, trust my, right. my decision. Right. To, and just over the last year, I finally have taken my name off the instruction so I'm not really taking on any new lessons wow. because I can't do that. I'm 60, I just turned 63. I can't do 10 lessons a day anymore. So, I, so now I'm kind of forcing the public to go with my assistants and they do such a great job that once they go with them, it's all good. Yeah, how, how many hours do you think you were putting in at, at the height of? Oh my God, so we were open 12 to nine during the week 10 to 9 on Saturday, 12 to 6 on Sunday. So I was there all of those hours. So whatever, whatever that is, right? So if it's 9 hours, 5 days a week, that's 45. And then 11 hours on Saturday and 6 hours on Sunday. So that's over 60. But when I first started doing lessons that didn't have any other instructors, I had no room in my, in, when we were at Golden Gate Shopping Center, the lessons had to be done with the public hitting in the cages. I didn't have instruction cages. It was just the token cages. So if I was doing a lesson, people in between the rounds would go in and hit, and it was so stressful. So I did that, but I decided I'm gonna get good, le better lessons in. So what, on the weekends, when we opened at 10, I would get there at eight in the morning, do lessons until we open, and when we closed, I would do a lesson or two after we closed. Oh, and on man. Sunday, being open 12 to 6, I would get there at 9, do lessons up to 12. And then at 6 o'clock, we close, and I'd do more lessons. But I'm still doing lessons during the time. So I would say 70, 75 hours yeah. a week. Yeah, and very stressful because when we were doing the lessons while we were open, we had to work in with walk-in traffic, and that was tough. And that takes its toll on you, obviously. It wore me out. Yeah. Wore me out when I had a day off. And I didn't take days off. The only days off I would have if we were closed for Thanksgiving or we were closed for Christmas or closed for New Year's, those were the only days I had off. Yeah, and you could see how it's expanded and, yes. and the work that you've put in. Yeah. Um, how do you feel now that you've kind of had to write off and, and, and step back? I, I feel great. Yeah. I feel great. Yeah. Yeah, I feel great. And how many, how many uh, folks do you have working for you? So I, all my guys are instructors. So I, my main guy is Bobby Amato, who came to me about a year and a half ago, and he's kind of taken the reins of manager. So he goes and opens every day, so I don't have to rush in every day. He takes care of the lessons, the scheduling, and all that, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, he's now also pretty full in his lessons, so he's taken over a lot of my lessons that I couldn't take. So he's my main guy, and he's making it a lot easier for me. Um, it's still hard for me to step back when I'm there, but when I'm not there, it's it's easy to step back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Um, and, okay, yeah, now you have uh, the new location, which right. is uh, basically Church and Cone. Right, so close to my second location, yeah. right, right, right maybe a half a mile away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and tell me about that. Tell me about the new, uh, the new facility, what you have going on there. So when we, were at Gate, when we were at uh, Gate City Boulevard, we had the six token cages, four live cages for hitting, and two mounds. And we knew that the token cages can stay as they are, but we needed to expand the live cages and the mounds so we didn't turn away teams when they wanted to rent stuff. So in the new locations, we have the six token cages, but we went from four live cages to 10 live cages, two mounds to four mounds, and we added an infield area where people can take ground balls and rent out the area, or we can still do lessons in there. And um, that's turned out to be great, where at Gates City Boulevard, I had to turn away teams all the time. Now we don't have to turn away teams. Now we can do all our lessons and still rent the cages out to teams. That's awesome. So that's where the whole thing has changed. That, so no more turning people away. That's good. I would hate to see how much money I threw away by <laughs> not being able to take these people. Right. Yeah. Um, and tell me about, you know, you went from, rewind a little bit, just okay. uh, 
going from you know baseball player to businessman, how did you have to um, you know read and I guess train yourself in that? Yeah, way too? It, you know what? Growing up in New York with street smarts, you learn street smarts from my father and my brothers and my sister and my mom. You learn that street smarts. Growing up in New York, I remember when we were 12 years old, we had a bus that was outside our uh, uh, garden apartment complex that took you to right towards Shea Stadium. And then you got on another bus, you got off, and then you walked to Shea Stadium. And, you know, back then, 12 years old, it was maybe a nickel to get on the bus. If you had a bus pass, if you were a student, you had a bus pass. So at 12 years old, we go to a Met game, me and my five friends, six friends, pay a nickel, get on the bus, go to a Met game, get on the bus, come back home. No parents, right? You did it yourself. That's it. That's how you learn that stuff, you know? And it's, it, I wouldn't let my daughters do that right now, but we're talking 1972, 1973. So we learned a ton of street smarts, and I never took a business course in college. I graduated New York Tech, but I never took a business course. I told you I, I majored in communications, radio and television, never took a business course. I just let my street smarts take over on any business decision I had all by, through my gut, gut feeling, and I never asked people for help at that time because I figured if I was gonna make a mistake, I wasn't gonna blame it on anybody else, it would be my mistake. And I just did it by gut. Wow. And you know, some were good, at good, some were bad, but I think most of the time it was good. Yeah. You know, most of the time it was good. Wow. So yeah. you've, you've just taken full ownership, yeah. like, all the way. Yeah. No classes, no nothing. I, had, I have an accountant who's with me, Paul Stutz. He's been with me for 37 years. If I had any financial questions, he would always advise me. So he, I had people like that, and he still he was my accountant when we started, and he's still my accountant. So, you know, any questions I had when my dad was alive, I would ask him. But, you know, he worked... You know, he worked two, three jobs. He wasn't a business owner. He worked in a clothing store. He was a manager. So he was a leader, but he didn't have to, you know, manage the money and this and that. He worked for a paycheck and, you know, and if we didn't have enough money, he'd get another job. And so um, maybe that's why I decided I wanted to own my own business so I didn't have to do what he did. Mm -hmm. You know, struggle business to business, you know, working all the time. You know, so I remember when he didn't work on Sundays, all he did was lie and watch TV because he was so tired from working six days a week. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, obviously he had a, a good impact on Yeah, you. and my brothers and my sister. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, many, how many brothers? So I have two older brothers. Mm -hmm. Mike is the oldest. He was born in 1955. So that makes him turning in April 69. I have an older brother. One between me and my older brother, Mike, is... My brother Steve, he was born in 1958, so he just turned uh, 66. He, he was born February, so he just, no, he's turning 66. Yeah, turning. He's turning 66, and then me, I was born in 1960, I just turned 63, and then I have my little sister who was born in 1962, and she just turned 61 in August. Wow. Yeah. And all were athletes. Yeah. My younger sister went to the college I went to on a scholarship. I made the Hall of Fame as a baseball player for the school, and she made it as a softball player at the same college. That's crazy. Yeah. And obviously, you, you talked about your dad being athletic. Obviously, yeah. that had an impact on, on uh, the whole family. You know, I was the, playing. I, yeah, I, my dad was a great basketball player. Mm -hmm. He was a great golfer. He, um, watched sports, never missed any of my games. So my relationship with my dad, Adam, compared to all the others in my family, were the sports. He took me, so in, in the 69 World Series against the Orioles, he took me to game three, right? He, had an, he, he knew people from the clothing business, players, Knicks, Mets, so he would get tickets, and, but only get two, and I was the one, I was the sports guy, the sports son. So, because my, where my brothers and sisters were good athletes, I followed the sports. You know, I was a big Met fan and a big Jet fan with Joe Namath and a big Nick fan and a big Ranger fan. So anything he got, I was the one. So he, when I, I was only eight years old, he took me to the World Series game. Um, 
Nolan Ryan pitched in that game as in relief. Wow. Um, in 1973, when the Mets had Willie Mays, they had a Willie Mays night in September of 1973. He got tickets for that. Um, so I went to that game, and he got tickets for all these things. Nick games, he knew a lot of the Knicks because it's one of the clothing stores he managed was in Manhattan. So a lot of the Knicks used to come in. He had a clothing store in Rigo Park, Queens. And in the, in the winter of 1969, going into 70, after the Mets won the World Series, he had Tommy Agee and Cleon Jones sign autographs. They were both from Alabama. They came in. I want to say January, February of 1970, and signed autographs at my dad's store. Somebody had to pick them up at the airport, and me and my dad went and picked up the two stars of the New York Mets. Wow. Yeah, so, so me and my, that was my, where me and my dad were buddies. We were the sports. You know, right before he died, he was in bad health. The last thing me and him did together, just me and him, he f lived in Florida. I took him to a Miami Heat game. And he died a couple of weeks after that. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm so sorry. that was what we liked, yeah. me and him. That's cool that you yeah. had that, that connection. Yes. Um, wow. And he never missed a game I played, ever. And my first hit in professional baseball in Lakeland, Florida, in the Florida State League, my first year, him and my mom was sitting in the stands. Wow. So he saw my first hit as a professional baseball player. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's hard to go from there, from here. Yeah. Um, in, you know, working with, with people, and um, you know, why is it important for kids or just people in general to have, to have sports and um, to have that, that influence of sports? Oh, man, it teaches you life. It teaches you life. It teaches that you're going to fail sometimes, and the answer is don't quit. Just keep rolling, right? It'll take you where it's supposed to take you. You know what I mean? Just give it all you got, and whatever happens, you're either good enough or you're not good enough. But if you don't give it all you got, then you'll never know if you were good enough, right? Give it all you got. By the time I finished playing, I knew I wasn't good enough, right? So I could live with that. But after I turned 30 or 40, if I look back at my career and said, God, why didn't I work harder in the off season? Why didn't I hit more? I didn't have to deal with that. So a lot of these people, when things don't go good, the first thing they want to do is jump ship and go find another place to play. Like it's somebody else causing the problems. Just turn around, look in the mirror. Because when you get a job and the boss is mad at you, you can't just quit. You know, you got to figure out how to make the boss happy with you, right? Just like a team. If, if, the, if you're not doing good enough to start on the field, don't quit. Figure out how to start. <laughs> Figure out what you have to do to get in that lineup, right? And that's, that's life. You're going to fail. Just figure it out. Figure it out. And that's, to me, that's the street smart part of being a, a New Yorker growing up. You just, you figure it out, right? Don't oh, you know what, we can't do that, it's not going to work. Let's figure out, it'll work. Somehow it'll work. We'll figure it out. And, and then usually there's a way to figure it out. If it has to be done, you got to figure it out. So I think, that's, I think that's the biggest thing that kids and parents got to realize is it's not always easy. And you know what, the chances are you're not playing pro baseball anyway. So just have fun with it. And don't jump ship. If you're not starting, figure out how to start. And guess what? If you don't get to that point, maybe you're not good enough. It's okay not to be good at something, right? Yeah, and that's the way, I guess, uh, you know, the world has changed is, uh, you know, like with teachers, you know, all of a sudden it's, it's the teacher's fault and or it's right. the coach's right. fault. Terrible. And, it's, and instead Terrible. of just, I, I, mean, I always said, I remember I played – Baseball. I said the greatest thing that ever happened was striking out, because I mean it's it's so much humility. You right. Know? Someone got the best of you. Yeah, and think of that, and then, and then you got to walk in front of everybody back to the dugout. Right. It's a tough thing, but you figure that if you can learn how to deal with that at ten years old, you can figure out what to do at twenty five years old. You know. So um, I think that's what sports is 
the most. And I think that parents have to realize that, you know, the chances are your kid's not going to be a professional baseball player or a professional basketball player or maybe even a college player. But just give it all you got. The one thing people say, my, my son's never going to be a pro baseball player. Well, how do you know? Give it all you have because it, I didn't think I was going to be one, right? Give it all you got and then figure, you know, and if, it's, if, if you give it all you got and, and it doesn't work out, then you're not good enough. Right? And maybe you're not. But how do you know at 13 if you're not good enough to play pro baseball at 20? How do you know? But just because you're great at 13 doesn't mean you're going to be great at 20. Because there's a lot of people chomping at the bit. You better now. believe it. And you, and you know all, I mean, you, like we said, you know all about this because you're, you're in that, that, that world. But, um, you know, I guess from, from when you were starting, from when you were a kid, and I'm sure there were camps and things, but now it is just elevated. Yeah, I never went it's, to a baseball camp. Right. That's, what, I, that's what I'm saying. You never. usually played with, with your friends yeah, or, or whatever. That's all. You might have I learned, had a league team. I or, learned more about baseball playing without coaches than I did actually playing in the Glen Oaks Little League. Right? I learned We used to go out and play wiffle ball and stick ball and baseball on the baseball field if nobody was there. I learned more about baseball that way than I did. And the competitiveness against your friends... These are your buddies, and all you wanted to do is beat the you-know-what out of them on the field. Whether it was football, basketball, hockey, baseball, it didn't matter. And then after the game, go to the pizza place, and let's have a couple of slices and a, and a Coke. You know, so um, I think that's what people got to realize. I remember when I went to first, I didn't say this before, but when I went to spring training, my first spring training, I looked out on the field, and there were 50 guys that could do what I could do that were a foot bigger than me. You know, reality sets in, right? Okay, who are they going to choose? If I steal 40 bases and he steals 40 bases and we're against each other, who are they going to choose, a six-foot-four guy or a five-foot-five guy? So, but again, I graduated college already. I knew I was smart. I was, re I was realistic, right? But I wasn't ready to go into the real world yet, so I just kind of milked it for three years, you know, and had, good do had fun doing it. <laughs>